So it's not saying uh, Israel's partially hard until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. And then, so it's not talking about subsequent time. Not talking about time at all. It's talking about in this manner, all Israel will be saved. Yeah. And so we have to ask in what manner we've got to go to verse 25 again, where he says a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. All I could see was this light coming in. The Holy Spirit went. It blew into me. I have never been the same since then. That was it. I'm done. I was born again. Welcome to the Weird Christian Podcast. I am your host, Samuel Delgado, and this is episode 67. I interview G.K. Bill about his book, Hidden Now Revealed, where we talk about Bible mysteries revealed in the New Testament. So we get into Romans 11 and the fullness of the Gentiles, and we talk about Jesus' re- reference to the abomination of desolation in the Olivet Discourse, and much more. So, with no further ado, let's get weird. Awesome. Uh, I'm excited to, to, to be discussing this book. Um, I, I've had an interview prepared for it for, I don't know, maybe months ever since I first read it. Uh, I, I love the book. Um, it's, a, it's, it's called Hidden Now Revealed. Um, why don't you tell the, the, the listener a little bit uh, about the book, just the premise of, of what it is. Yes. Um, <clears throat> This was a book that I uh, asked to get some help on from um, my former doctoral student, Ben Glad, who's also, who published some other books together, like uh, The Story Retold. Mm -hmm. And um, he's a former doctoral student of mine from Wheaton College. I had written about a 50-page section uh, on uh, the use of mystery in the New Testament, And I'd written that section in a book called John's Use of the Old Testament Revelation. And the reason uh, that I wrote a section on all the uses of uh, the word mysterion, which is mystery in the New Testament, was because that word occurs at least three times, I think three times in the book of Revelation. So I was discussing the meaning of the word, and I felt like I had to go to the other words, turned into a longer chapter. Hmm. And then I got to thinking, you know, I really, I really ought to investigate and 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 really analyze uh, in more depth all the places where the word mystery occurs in the New Testament. And so um, I got Ben Glad, and I said, Ben, take what I've written, and let's expand this, and then I'll. Um, work on along with you as well as as you expand i'll read over what you say etc cetera, etc cetera. so this this comes from an actual approximate 50 to 60 page section that i uh i wrote in that book john's use of the old testament revelation now this has been this has been expanded uh to about oh, a little over 300 pages <clears throat> so um what we did is we also looked into the Old Testament, the Old Testament background also of um, the word mystery, which we think is in uh, Daniel 2 and 4. Um, we also had a chapter called Mystery Without Mystery because we believe that the way the word is actually used uh, actually uh, expresses a concept that's used elsewhere in the New Testament quite a bit with, without having the word mystery. Hmm. And so um, <clears throat> what we did is uh, uh, we, we looked at mystery in each uh, New Testament book and found mainly that, that mystery uh, has the idea usually of an unexpected beginning fulfillment. So something very interesting happens when you look at the word mystery. Uh, it is always in connection in some way with an Old Testament quotation or an illusion. And, and so why is that? Well, in the context, it's, the mystery is that this Old Testament uh, illusion or reference is, is a, a prophecy from the Old Testament, and it's being uh, uh fulfilled in a beginning way 
in an unexpected way. So, for example, in Matthew, he tells the people there, he tells his, his disciples, to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of, um, of heaven. And there he's, uh, and, and a number of scholars agree, well, that, that goes back to Daniel 2, where it talks about uh, the mystery of the kingdom. When God destroys the kingdoms of evil, he immediately sets up his kingdom and defeats them. And it looks like it happens in one swift event. And um, if you remember the images of a, um, uh, a rock cut out without hands that smashes a statue that represents the kingdom of evil. And, um, and then it says God's kingdom set up and that that stone grew into a mountain and fell the earth representing the kingdom of God at the very least. I think it also represents the foundation stone of the temple, mm. but, uh, but uh, that's not important for our purposes now. So, um, so when you uh, see this word in Matthew, um, Matthew goes on and gives the parables of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. For example, it's the, the parables of the tares. So you have weeds growing up among the good wheat. Um, and what that shows is, whereas in the Old Testament, you would expect the wicked to be separated from the righteous, the wicked judge and the righteous rewarded. Uh, and that's what would happen at the time of the final kingdom. Now you find an unexpected beginning fulfillment. The kingdom has begun, but the final judgment isn't here yet. Hmm. Oh, for example, also, you find the idea of uh, the kingdom is like a mustard seed, small, and it grows. Well, according to the Old Testament, when the kingdom of God would defeat the kingdom, wicked kingdoms of the world, uh, it would immediately control and dominate the whole earth. It would be yeah. big, uh, like Daniel 2. But no, this grows slowly. Uh, or it's like leaven, grows apparently invisibly imperceptibly. Hmm. Uh, and so th th these are mysterious beginning fulfillments. And, and so what we found is that was really the case, not just in the Gospels, but in Paul and the book of Revelation as well. And so that, that this, uh, these unexpected beginning fulfillments really are part and parcel of a larger notion, which is what we call already and not yet eschatology. Hmm. When, you ask it, when you get eschatology happening, not in one swift movement at the end, but something that begins uh, very, very um, uh, uh, surely and definitely, but not consummately, and it takes time for that consummation to reach, then you're getting something unexpected. Already and not yet eschatology is unexpected because yeah. you expected the final judgment to be with one swift blow in the Old Testament and the establishment of the kingdom to be with one swift blow. So really this book really is about hermeneutics and it's about mm -hmm. the old and the new and yeah. uh, how the Old Testament relates to the new, that sort of thing. So I probably... Uh, explain more than you wanted in in that no, that, was uh, perfect. In that answer. No, it was perfect. Yeah, you actually anticipated some of the questions that I, that I had. Um, so you kind of set up the interview uh, just just as I was going to start it. So uh, so th you did it perfect. Um, I love the book, and yeah, it's very very meaty. Um, and I love how you started out um, in in Daniel and the concept of the mystery um, being expounded upon with Nebuchadnezzar seem to have some realization of himself being a part of this statue that he saw, but then it was expounded upon when Daniel interpreted the dream. And so that was sort of like the foundational um, like in, in, in interpretation for, for mystery. And we kind of saw that played out, as you mentioned, in the New Testament, expounding upon concepts that were only known in part in the, in the old. Right. right? Yeah. Um, so I loved it. Anyway, I have a ton of questions um, cause you, because you're kind of surveying through mystery all throughout the New Testament. There's, um, you know, a wide variety of, of different topics that you cover with it that, that are uh, mystery that are hidden now revealed. So Correct. Um, I want to start with 
Romans 11, um, Israel's jealousy mystery. Uh, you talk about that in the book, but I wanted to ask because this is something that's taught by dispensationalists. Um, they, they love to use this to, sh to show how we're in a different dispensation of Gentiles now and that somehow whenever the age is, you know, the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled, that dispensation is going to change over to Israel. Um, and so often it's taught that Israel being a nation now is a fulfillment of, of biblical prophecy. And so um, and you did talk about uh, Israel's je jealousy mystery, but I also want you to uh, address that sort of hermeneutic of, of dispensationalists and how they view uh, Romans 11. You want me to say how dispensationalists view it and then contrast it with how I view it? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I just want to know your your thoughts. I mean, explain the, you know, Israel's jealousy mystery that we see in Romans 11, uh, and, and perhaps, you know, you'll make that clear enough uh, to show the distinction between the, what the dispensationalists view. Um, but I do want to address what the dispensationalists, how they view it, just because it's such a popular view. Um, so Yes. And it's not just dispensationalists to view it that way. Right. There are there are dispensational premillennialists or progressive premillennialists, um, but also historic premillennialists. It's amazing there are three kinds of premillennialism, but yeah. there are. Yeah. And um, historic premillennialists would include among their number um, Doug, Douglas Moo and D. A. Carson. So very very fine scholars, but they are premillennial and they do see some on the basis of this text, some historical role for Israel. Yeah. And I know that Douglas Moo does because we have personally debated this in front of students at Wheaton College, mm -hmm. this very passage, Romans 11, mm -hmm. 26, which says, and uh, thus all Israel will be safe. I'm, I'm pretty confident that um, D.A. Carson uh, would, would agree generally with him, I think. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, so what we have here then uh, is verse 25, and you, you, you've asked, a, you know, a very in-depth question, so I hope this isn't going to be too uh, detailed for the listening audience. But I'm looking at my Bible, Romans 11, 25, and the New American Standard. I do not want you brothers to be uninformed of this mystery. There you have the word mystery, mystery on lest you be wise to your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and thus all Israel will be saved. And then it says, it, it quotes another uh, um, a quotation from the Old Testament, the deliverer will come from Zion, he'll remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So uh, verse 26 says, and thus all Israel will be saved. And that's right after it said that there's this partial hardening that's happened during uh, what would be called the so-called church age until the fullness of the Gentiles have come in. Then verse 26 immediately says, and so, or and thus all Israel will be saved. Now the premillennialist takes that as a time word, and mm -hmm. then all Israel. Right. Yeah. They'll be saved. That's yeah. typically how it is taken. And um, uh, Paul, as far as I can tell, never uses this Greek word. It's translated thus or so, which in Greek is hutos. Um, he never translates it as a time word. It always means in this manner, in this manner. Now, mm. there may be a couple of places in the book of Acts uh, where it's translated as a time word. Uh, there may be uh, a number of places in extra-biblical Hellenistic Greek where it's time, but you got to go with the way the author typically uses it. He typically uses it as not a time word, but an in this manner word. So mm -hmm. it should be translated, and in this manner all Israel will be saved. And he's used that same word uh, earlier um, in verse 5, First of all, in verse 4, 
um, he's talking about Elijah. Now, Elijah said they killed your prophets. I alone am left. What's the divine response to him? And it's God says, I've kept for myself 7,000 men who've not bowed the knee to Baal. Then it says, in the same manner then, there's also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. So that that phrase, in the same manner, is the same word uh, yeah. in, in this manner um, as hutos, the same word we find in verse um, verse 25. And you can find other places in, in Romans 9 through 11 where you find that Greek word meaning in this manner. And so verse 26 shouldn't mean, shouldn't say, and so or thus all Israel will be saved, and in this manner all Israel yeah. will be saved. Okay. Gotcha. So what manner is that? What is the manner in which they're going to be saved? What is the way in which they're going to be saved? It's not a time word now. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's not saying uh, Israel's partially hard until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. And then, so it's not talking about subsequent time. Not talking about time at all. It's talking about in this manner, all Israel will be saved. Yeah. And so we have to ask, in what manner? We've got to go to verse 25 again, where he says, a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. What does that mean? That means, as we know, that the majority of Israel throughout the church age will be hardened. They won't come to believe. Only a remnant will. Yeah. <laughs> and then the church age, the fullness of the Gentiles, will come to an end. And then he says, in this manner, all Israel will be saved. Well, in what manner will all Israel be saved? In a remnant-saving manner. Wow. Now, why is that a mystery? Well, as we've just said, in the Old Testament, the salvation of Israel, the kingdom of Israel, it, it looked like, you know, it come in one swift movement, and it would be uh, the whole nation the stone, for example, representing the kingdom of Israel. Um, you, 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 you could perceive that some Old Testament prophecies like Daniel 2 are referring to all Israel hmm. that will be saved. Yeah. Um, and part of the mystery here is, no. The unexpected fulfillment is that a remnant, will be saved. This is why in Romans 9, Paul says in verse 6, it's not as though the word of God has failed, for they're not all Israel who are descended from Israel. In other words, there are some who interpreted God's promise about the salvation of Israel to be the majority of the nation. But Paul says, no. No, actually what God really prophesied was that a remnant would be saved. And that's why verse 6 of chapter 9 uh, says, it's not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all um, Israel who are descended from Israel. So there's a physical Israel and there's a spiritual Israel, and it's the spiritual Israel that is saved. Hmm. So in reality... From the perspective of some Jewish perceptions that all Israel would be saved in the Old Testament, um, uh, the way it's been fulfilled is, is a mystery. It's yeah. really uh, the remnant of Israel will be saved. Now, actually, if you go back to the Old Te Testament, I don't find any clear prophecy that the majority of Israel will be saved. Right, uh, yeah. And I've challenged my students. Yeah. Find me a, a passage. Well, a good point. Ezekiel 36, uh, um, I think Ezekiel 39 and um, chapter 20 talk about the whole house of Israel will be delivered. Mm -hmm. But in those contexts, if you look at them, uh, it defines the whole house of Israel as a remnant house. Yeah. The whole house is the whole of the remnant not the whole of the nation. Now, I, I, I could go into further detail about that. If we had a premillennialist here right now, I probably would have to do that. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and I'd be happy to do that as an appendix to this conversation. 
So from one perspective, there was this appears to be to have been an expectation on the part of Jews at Paul's time that the majority of Israel would be saved and that that was something that was rooted in the Old Testament. Paul is saying, no, the way it's being fulfilled is unexpected from your perspective. Uh, it's, a rem- it's a remnant, just as it was in the days of Elijah. Remember, uh, in, in, in the Elijah narrative earlier in chapter um, 11, remember, Elijah said, I alone am left. Gus said, no, there's 7,000. And then it says, mm, in the yeah. same way, there's come to be at the present time a remnant. Yeah, wow. So, 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 so really, from in my opinion, from the Old Testament perspective, um, all along it said only a remnant would be saved. But from the Jewish perspective at the time of the Old Testament, this is a mysterious beginning fulfillment. It's a remnant. Yeah. Um, so I believe that may be w- one aspect of the mystery. I think actually uh, another aspect of the mystery here is that in, in the Old Testament, um, it was to be the salvation of Israel that sparked off the salvation of of the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. But in this chapter, Paul is saying Mm -hmm. in verse 14, that he wants his Gentile ministry to be magnified in order that he may save some Gentiles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think the the historical order of Mm -hmm. salvation from one perspective is, is, is being uh, reversed. Uh, Now it is true. It was true that the first Christians were Jews in Jerusalem, in the book of Acts. So we see that, right? Yeah. So so it was fulfilled, according to Isaiah 49, that you'll be to be a light, uh, that you're, the Messiah was to return and restore Israel and be a light to the nations. And so um, uh, Acts 13, 47 quotes that and says that's just what's happening. Um, so the first Jewish Christian believers were Jews, and then that leads to subsequent Gentile salvation. But very quickly, and this is unexpected, very quickly, the majority of the nation rejects. And the ministry of Paul to the Gentiles is going to spark off Jewish salvation. And that, I think, I think that that's at the heart of the mystery. It's a, it's, a, it's a remnant salvation of the Jews that still is part of the mystery, but I think even more, it is the apparent reversal of the expectation of Jew first and then Greek. And by the way, Romans 1 and 15 is, is bookended by to the Jew first and then to the Greek, very interestingly. So they're both true, if you're following me. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's not easy. This is not easy stuff. No, no, I, I love that uh, explanation. I love it. Um, my question is, do you see that remnant being fulfilled in Paul's day, or is that throughout redemptive history? I think it's throughout the church age. Yeah. So this well, yeah. remnant, this this partial hardening to Israel, which is the majority of hardening, it's a big yeah. partial, okay, occurs uh, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Yeah. That's the end of the church age. Gotcha. It began began with Paul though. Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay. So my next question, uh, Zechariah 14 uh, speaks about a a pilgrimage to Israel to practice the uh, feast of booths um, or tabernacles. Yeah. Um, Do you see that as, um, because the premillennials will look at that as a reason for, um, you know, a thousand year reign on earth, do you see that as symbolic? And and if so, or or do you see that as taking place in history? Well, how are you relating that to mystery? I have in my notes. How's that coming out of the mystery book? I'm trying to remember. I I was asking that myself. So uh, we we don't, we don't have to address it, um, but it was in my notes. So it it must've been in a roundabout way been related. Um, but we can toss it out. Um, 
Why don't, why don't we address that at another time and try to um, stick with the uh, uh, the mystery book? Okay. So Hosea 6, 1 through 2 talks about um, Israel uh, asleep for two days and being raised on the third. Do you see yeah. that being um, completely fulfilled in Christ with no more future fulfillment? No, no, I see Christ as, uh, again, uh, that's, he's, a, I think he's the beginning fulfillment. And then all, of, uh, he, he, we are corporately uh, represented in him. He is our corporate uh, uh, representative. Um, so we have, you know, he's, there's corporate solidarity. Uh, we call it the one and the many sometimes. So definitely, Um uh, he begins it. In fact, that that's of course alluded to in First Corinthians fifteen uh, three and four, and uh, and in First Corinthians, after that's uh, alluded to, um, you you have the statement um, just a little later, a few verses later. Uh, where in verse 20 it says, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Right. So he's the first fruit, but others must be raised because they're part of the first fruits. If you right. remember in the Old Testament, the Israelites were to offer the first of their crop because really it represented all that they had from the Lord. Hmm. And so there was a solidarity between the first fruits and the whole crop. Mm, and so, right. so Christ is the first, but we're part, we're part of that. Um, so verse 22 says, for as an Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. So, um, so yeah, verse 20 is really a, uh, a major way to understand that allusion to Hosea in, in verse four, that he was buried. He was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. It's a, the third day resurrection is according to the scriptures. Wow. Yeah. And so that's, I think it's mainly Hosea. Uh, yeah. Perhaps secondarily in mind could be Jonah. So he's mm -hmm. raised after three days and Jesus even says, just Jonah's in the body of, of, the, of the fish three days and three nights. So must the Son of Man be um, in the body of the earth three days and three nights. Mm -hmm. So possibly that's secondarily in mind, but I think primarily is uh, is the, the, this one from uh, Hosea, where it says resurrection will, will take place uh, uh, after three days on the, on the third day. So, um, did, did you want to ask a follow-up question to that? Um, yeah, I, so there's a, yeah, maybe this is a, a, a total throwaway, but this may be a question that many listeners have that, that follow, um, follow this teaching. There's a teaching going around that's been made popular, um, I think Jonathan Kahn's one, one that's made this popular, that we see here is also a prophecy uh, for Israel being made to be asleep for, for two days, being two millennia, and then to be raised on the third, um, which also follows that dispensational idea that somehow we're going to see a, a shift at the end of the church age to Israel. Um, so I, I just want to bring that up to see. Um, well, I think what we need to do, this is why it's so important to study the use of the old and the new. Yeah. You don't have the Hosea passage applied to a millennium in Revelation mm -hmm. 20 or anywhere else. Mm -hmm. You do have the Hosea passage applied to Christ's resurrection. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're going to let Scripture uh, interpret Scripture. Yeah. So uh, Hosea 6 refers to actual days and not thousands of years, mm -hmm. according to Paul. So I'll go with yeah. Paul rather than whoever else is making that interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. All right. Thank you. Okay. So 
Jesus and the uh, Olivet Discourse refers to the abomination uh, of desolation. Do you see that as a forewarning to Titus and the destruction of the temple in 70 AD? Um, and if so, the mystery revealed in 2 Thessalonians um, is that there would be many antichrists before uh, Daniel's uh, prophecy. So do you see that as some something that's cyclical? Okay. Now, you're, I think you have two passages in mind. You mentioned one, 2 Thessalonians, but the other is actually 1 John 2.18, which says, My little children, it's the last hour. And just as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, I tell you that many Antichrists yeah. have already come from this. We know it's the last hour. I think that's what you were partially quoting. About, yeah, and we've about talked about that before. Christ. My question is really in reference to the uh, the abomination abomination of desolation that Jesus was referring to. Yeah, um, that was my that was my question. Um, Do yeah. you see that? As so I think that um, <clears throat> I, I, for myself, I think it was fulfilled uh, when when the Romans sacrificed. Uh, you know, wasn't just the Greeks. I think the Romans also sacrificed in uh, the Holy of Holies. So I think that was, I, I actually think the beginning of the, of the abomination of desolation began with Antiochus Epiphanes, yeah. the Greek emperor, mm -hmm. but it wasn't complete. And then the Romans come, mm -hmm. they continue to fulfill that prophecy. Mm -hmm. And then Paul in, uh, in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, I think is saying it will be fulfilled again. I don't, there's some who think he is saying, preterists especially, think he is saying, He's just reaffirming the prophecy that there'll be an abomination of desolation in 70 AD with the Romans. Mm -hmm. When he says that the man of lawlessness who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes a seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. So <clears throat> some take that uh, as a reference to 70 AD. Some take it as a reference to a rebuilt temple on this earth. That's why premillennialists take it. Right, yeah. So they see a rebuilt temple and a further abomination of desolation in the future. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I see that Antiochus Epiphanes, Epiphanes began to fulfill the Daniel prophecy. Uh, the Romans continued to fulfill it. And then I think that uh, there will be in the future um, a climactic fulfillment with the Antichrist. I think Paul is talking about that. I think he is talking about the future. And so is he talking about the Antichrist actually going into a physical temple? Um, I don't think so. Um, the phrase temple of God in Paul and even elsewhere in the New Testament, without exception, it's used Oh, about, as I remember, 10 times, it refers to the church. Yeah. Or it refers to believers dwelling with God in heaven in the book of Revelation. It is not a physical temple. That's the point. So <clears throat> what does it mean when uh, it says that he takes his seat in the temple of God? In Greek, it's naos to theou. Um, I don't think he's coming into a physical temple, as the premillennialists would say, and it's going to be rebuilt in the future. I think that he's coming in, uh, he's going to exert such an influence in the church, the community of faith, the visible church, um, that uh, he, he will have dominant influence in it and to take a seat. Is, is symbolic for having authority. Remember, Jesus says, um, you know, the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. Mm -hmm. but they don't do what Moses says. Mm -hmm. And and likewise, chapter 17 says, Babylon the Great was sitting on many waters. So that phrase, sitting, um, has to do with exercise influence over. Mm -hmm. um, wow. uh, and, and that, 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 I think that's what it means here as well. It's not some kind of literal seat in a 
uh, piece of furniture in a, in a physical temple. Now, what's interesting about this is that's the not yet. That's going to happen in the future. Right. But all of a sudden, Paul reverses himself, and in verse 7, he says, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Hmm. In other words, the lawless ones come to the future, but then he says, wait a minute, it's already here. Yeah. And it's in the sense, I think, of First John. You've heard that Antichrist is coming. I tell you, many Antichrists have already come. From this, we know it's the last hour. So the fulfillment of this prophecy from Daniel is beginning fulfillment, mm -hmm. uh, even before 70 AD with Paul yeah. and with the churches and, um, and throughout the age until this final consummative uh, uh, desolation of the community of faith, which is the temple of God by the Antichrist. And wow. so here in, in Thessalonians, it's talking about false teachers, because you'll remember how he introduces uh, this section in 1 Thessalonians 2.2. 2. He doesn't want the believers to be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. In other words, there was a false teaching that, hey, the final day of Christ, it's already come. It's come. It's, it's come in some spiritual way, and we're not to expect anything else. That was a false teaching, radical preterism, okay? Yeah. yeah. That was a false teaching. And so he says, no, there are two signs that you can know the day of the Lord has not come yet. And one is the physical antichrist isn't here. And the second is there's going to be a, um, a falling away, apostasy. Apostasy comes first, then the man of lawlessness. And um, so I, I think uh, this is not an apostasy in Israel. Israel's already apostate. Yeah, of course. This is yeah. not an apostasy in the world of unbelievers. They're yeah. already yeah. <laughs> unbelievers. How can they fall away? Absolutely. This is at the very end a mass falling away in the visible church, which makes it easy for the Antichrist to come into and to have influence over. Wow. Yeah, and I, I love that interpretation because it, it it makes sense, whereas you you stated some holes that we see um, in the other views where they say, oh, this is Israel, which, like I said, it, it, it just doesn't make sense um, for that to be Israel. Or, no, and I think he hears, let's, let's, let, let's, let Paul interpret Paul. When he yeah. uses that phrase elsewhere, it's the church. Sure, yeah, absolutely. When John uses it elsewhere, and and and, and the synonyms of it, it, it's it's the heavenly dwelling of the church with with God. So uh, there's one place where temple of God in the Gospels uh, is, as I recall, in, in the mouth of false witnesses, and they say that Jesus said, you know, if you destroy the temple of God, he would raise it up. There it is, physical. That's the only use, but it's counterbalanced by Jesus raising up the new temple. Mm. As wow. remember John two, he says, tear this temple down. I'll rebuild it in three days. Wow. Yeah. There you go. Wow. I love that. Um, so I have quite a follow-up question on that. Um, do you see the Antichrist entering into the church deceptively and using false teaching to bring about this falling away? Or do you see it more as a forceful use of fear um, that would cause the falling away? That I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm just I don't, I don't, I don't like yeah. scriptures clear enough on it. Sure. Uh, yeah. It's, whether, yeah. whether he causes the falling away or um, whether there is the falling away that makes things um, easier for him to come and exercise his influence. Sure. I tend to think because of the order in uh, in Second Thessalonians that the falling away occurs first. Hmm, really? And then the man of lawless, lawlessness, uh, hmm. lawlessness comes. Let's look at that phrase okay. again. It says, let no one in any way deceive you about the day of the Lord, for it will not come. Okay unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Hmm. Now that, that, um, yeah, that first seems to be attached to apostasy and then followed by the man of lawlessness. I think it's 
for myself, the preferable way to read it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and it says, with the same revealed, it almost seems like it, it the apostasy could could be closely related to to the Antichrist. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, it's still possible. Yeah, it's still possible the Antichrist causes the apostasy. I I tend to, you know, uh, they're certainly inextricably linked. Yeah, but yeah, I, I, mean, I, I tend to yeah. I, I tend to think about the apostasy comes first. I, I don't think it's a a major issue. Yeah. I just I, uh, on the surface of it, it seems the apostasy comes first, but um, I, I don't think it's an issue of great um, moment. Yeah, I mean, and that would make sense that because there's apostasy, that would allow the Antichrist to then. Um, enter in so this will be uh my last question and this was one of the um i I just i love this part in the book so this is ephesians 3 um the mystery uh as christ as true israel can you talk about that right um yeah paul says he uses mystery a lot in ephesians and he says in ephesians 3 which is where we focus our discussion in the book. He says that he had written them that, uh, that by revelation that was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief, and by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by us to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit, that is, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So, um, so what is the mystery here? A common understanding of it by a dispensationalist is that the church did not, that the Old Testament did not foresee the existence of the church. So that when the Jews reject the gospel, uh, there is created this parenthetical church age that was not foreseen by the Old Testament. And then when the church is raptured, then the end time clock starts ticking again, and God starts dealing with national Israel again. And this leads up ultimately to Christ coming and their acceptance of him. Um, I, I, I I don't think that uh, that is uh, that is the case. In fact, if you look at the word ecclesia, church, it's all over the Old Testament. It's not a mystery. Mm-hmm. Is it refers to the the kahal in Hebrew, the congregation of Israel. Yeah. And Paul refers to refers to the ecclesia to the numerous times in his writings, four or five alone, as I recall, and. First Corinthians, hmm. and uh, it is actually that phrase actually that he applies to the Corinthian church is uh, from um, the Old Testament, and it is from I'm just flipping to it Nehemiah. Listen to me, Nehemiah thirteen one says, on that day, they read from the book of Moses, the Israelites, they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of people, and there were, there was found written in it that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the ecclesia, the U. The only place where you get ecclesia, the U, Hmm. congregation or church of God, is in this passage. Hmm. So I think Paul is alluding to that passage. Hmm. Who, Who is the Israelite congregation of God today? It's you Corinthians. Wow. Which is amazing because they came out of immorality. You can see what kind of immorality they came out came out of. Remember First Corinthians yeah. six. Some of you were uh, homosexuals, and thieves, and murderers, and so on. Yeah. But wow. you were uh, washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. So it's amazing the Corinthians of all people could be called this. That's incredible. But they are in Christ. Why? Because He's the true Israel. Yeah. As Isaiah 49, 3, 
says of the Messiah, the suffering servant, you are my servant Israel. Couldn't be clearer. Hmm. Yeah. So what are we, what's the mystery here? If the church uh, is not, you know, if, if this isn't talking about the mysterious age of the church, it was unforeseen by the Old Testament. So if the revelation of the church is a revelation of a mystery, I don't think that's it. Well, what is it? Well, in the Old Testament, to be identified as a true Israelite, you had to take on the marks of an Israelite, circumcision. You had to obey the Sabbath. You had to give sacrifices and worship in the temple. And so these were all identification markers. And this is why he, he says just before this passage, um, in, in, in 2.11, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who were called un uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. You were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants, having no hope. But now in Christ, you have been brought near. And... Uh, and, and then he says in verse 14, for Christ himself is our peace, who made Jew and Gentile one, broke down the barrier of the dividing wall hmm. by abolishing in his flesh the enmity. Well, what's the dividing wall? What's the enmity? He says it, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Wow. wow. What are those ordinances? Hmm. Colossians 2 tells us what the ordinances are. It's a parallel. Colossians and Ephesians have many parallels. What are the ordinances? Listen to what those ordinances are. Um, they are uh, verse 16, let no one act as your judge in regard to food or drink. You had, you had to obey the clean and unclean food laws, you see. Yeah. Now no one can judge you that way. Uh, let no one judge you with respect to a Sabbath day. Uh, we don't keep the Sabbath the way Israel did with yeah. all those millions of rules. Hmm. And it's on a different day. Um, and then it says this, if you've died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, Colossians 2.20, why is if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to ordinances such as do not handle, do not touch, do not taste. Again, that's referring to the unclean and clean food laws. Hmm. You, those, those ordinances have now been destroyed, Ephesians says. Yeah. So yeah. what's Paul talking about when he says that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, fellow members, fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus? It means that they can be God's true people. Israel, without having the identification markers of old Israel, yeah. of circumcision, clean and unclean food laws, making actual sacrifices, worshiping in a physical temple. Why? It's because it says that they have become these fellow heirs, members of the body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus. Yeah. He's, he's the only marker we have yeah, as believers is Christ. Yeah. It's the only that's marker. Fantastic. And to be fellow heirs, that's an Israelite term. That's a term for inheriting the promised land. So that's an Israelite thing. Mm. To be partakers of the promise, these are the promises about Israel. So yeah. this is about the church being true Israel without having to take on the markers. That was unforeseen in the Old Testament. That's why this is a revelation of a mystery. Yeah, I love that. I want to bring up one more thing that you made a really good case and point um, just then. We have all those markers that some of those you don't see creeping back in the church, but some of them you, you do, right? We don't see that things like sacrifices being made, but we do no. see some, some, some teaching that we do need to keep the dietary laws. And the Sabbath is one of those things that... I'm seeing so much of that of, you know, churches and denominations and, and, and Christians wanting to revert back to to the Sabbath. And one of their claims is, oh, it was one of the Ten Commandments, 
So this is this is forever. Um, Jesus said, "Keep obey my commandments." And so, for some reason, it's you know those, those other ordinances we're not seeing a fall back to, um, but uh, we do see it with the Sabbath. So I just want to bring that up. Um, you know, I don't know if you have anything to say about that, but I just wanted to bring that up. Okay, I'm a little unclear. So, so there's some who are saying we should keep some of the ordinances now. Is that what you're saying? No, yeah, no, I'm I'm, I'm saying, um, you know, what you've clearly taught is that we do not need to keep those ordinances. Right. Ordinances, and I'm saying um, that you know, basically, what you said would just disprove any teaching that that we do. Um, but I'm just recognizing that there are there's there's a movement and uh, of people trying to maintain and keep keep the sabbath um yeah i, I did you know, i was inviting you to comment on it but you but you don't need, you um, need to if you don't have well to i mean i, I don't know I, that, that's still a little general are they saying that we should keep some of the jewish laws to keep the sabbath is that is that what you're saying yeah well i mean it's like seventh day adventist um and then you know i i know that there's certain christians that you know they yeah, I, I think you know seventh day adventist uh, have the Sabbath on Sunday is keeping a Jewish ritual. I don't think that's why I would, one reason I would disagree with it. Hmm. Um, I think there's a redemptive historical reason for having the Sabbath on Sunday because it's the day of the resurrection. Yeah. Um, we know it's the practice of the early church. Um, I don't think that's a heresy. Hmm. I think that in that case, that's, that's just something that uh, I, I would say is is a, a false understanding of the relation of the old to the new. Um, so, you know, for example, you get messianic Jewish right. churches yeah. that say that we should adhere to some of the various um, ordinances. Yeah. Of, of, of old Israel. I, I think they are more clearly, in my opinion, more clearly in violation of what Paul has said in Ephesians 2 and 3. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, if they had a, a temple and they could sacrifice, they would, I think. Um, yeah, probably. So, so your question's a hard one. Um, um, I, I just have to hear more how certain people are trying to be Jewish and keeping the Sabbath as Christians, but, um, yeah, I was just thinking for the listener, I know it's topical. It's something that it's come up, um, probably even on this podcast before. And so, um, but you know, like, like I said, uh, that was one of the more powerful things, um, I think in this book. And so, um, you know, I, I love that teaching. I just wanted to, you know, emphasize that for anyone that perhaps is, yeah, coming to a different understanding um so yeah um, yeah and i make the distinction between uh something that a false understanding of scripture and heresy hmm. heresy is something that leads one to final judgment hmm. not salvation right you can believe something false in the scriptures that doesn't have to do with salvation hmm. gotcha. and i yeah. think that believing that we should meet on Saturday instead of Sunday. Is, I, I I just think that's a uh, a false concept, but yeah. I don't think that's going to lead to the final judgment of Seventh Day Adventists who truly trust that Christ sure. paid the penalty for their sin and came to life yeah. again as the Lord God. Yeah, absolutely, awesome. So those awesome. are sometimes we sometimes we uh, confuse what's false with what's heretical. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, yeah, those terms are almost used uh, synonymously. But if someone says, "Hey, you got to keep all the ordinances of Israel, uh, or you can't be saved," well, that's the heresy Paul's combating in Galatians. Mm. Mm. So that is yeah. heresy. Yeah, no, I love that. Awesome. You're saying you have to do that. Yeah. To be saved. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Um, well, I'll put links um, in the show notes for anyone that's interested in getting the book. I love the book. Um, we just kind of touched on some of the some of the things that that, that uh, you expound upon in it. Um, so I'll invite you to have any closing thoughts and uh, close us out in prayer. No, uh, you know, at some point, if you want, we can talk about Zechariah 14. It was just uh, it would have dominated about 
you know, a third of our time. And I yeah. thought you probably wanted to get to the book, but I do discuss that passage in my shorter commentary on uh, the book of Revelation and my um, discussion of the millennium in chapter 20. Okay. I need to go back and, and reread that then. All right. Good deal. Well, very good. Awesome. Well, th thanks again. Uh, I, I enjoyed our conversation. Um, yeah, we close this out. Sure. You want me to pray? Yeah, please. Father, we thank you for this time of discussion of your word. We pray that your word would form us, our thoughts, and affect what we do, and that we would um, think and say and do all those things which are honoring to you. In Christ's name, amen. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for listening. Make sure to like and subscribe. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to share it with somebody you know. And with that being said, we'll catch you on the next one.